Four Corners Podcast. Wonderful. And hello, everyone, and welcome to our next episode of the Four Corners Podcast with your host, Chris Mimorati. We have a very special guest joining us today. He is Dr. Edward Lutwak. And if you don't know of Edward Lutwak, then I think you've been living on the rock for the last 50 years. He's a very seminal character in international relations. He is a strategic advisor to the United States and uh, certain treaty allies. He has served on U.S. presidential transition teams, testifying before committees of the U.S. House of Representatives and the Senate, and has also advised the U.S. Armed Forces, DOD, uh, United States Department, um, uh, White House Chief of Staff, and foreign governments, including Japan. He is the author of many books and countless other pieces. His first book, Coup d'État, A Practical Handbook, published in 1968, has since been published and translated into 23 other languages. The book was uh, derived from his experience as a London-based oil consultant. His most recent book, The Rise of China versus the Logic of Strategy, is based on research he conducted for the U.S. government. Welcome, to Edward. Good day. And I'm sure you do many of these interviews, as I've seen in the past, so this is going to be a very interesting conversation because what we're trying to do is stay away from the very obvious topics of U.S., China, these big macro things that you can read and learn about anywhere and everywhere, and I'm sure you've written too much about this to discuss again in another podcast. So we're going to go a little bit more niche and speak about three specific issues in this interview to get the audience's um, attention into less obvious parts of the world. So the first thing I want to discuss with you, Edward, is what do you think the effects are of smaller middle tier nations on the geopolitical landscape? Because we always speak about the US and China, Russia, Iran, and these kinds of nations. But what impact do smaller nations have on what happens globally and the consensus that nations now need to build, given as more nations are becoming more more powerful globally? Well, um, in today's a global political landscape, there are um, quite a few uh, nations that, or states that are small states that have uh, quite a lot of influence over uh, areas of the world or sectors of life, uh, global sectors of life. And there is a, a list of them. Um, for example, uh, for what, with, with, with whatever results, um, the Kingdom of Norway has been very active in foreign affairs, mm-hmm. acting and intervening um, in diplomatically, the famous Oslo process, whatever you may think of it. But the Oslo process uh, had to fail because uh, uh, the Palestinian side has other problems, but improve life enormously and irreversibly for the actual existing Palestinians who live there. And this was all done by the Norwegians. Um, You have um, a country like Singapore that provides a a useful platform for many, many different parties, including uh, the United States Air Force. Um, there is no U.S. Air Force base in Singapore, but anybody who goes through Singapore Airport and goes up to one of the observation points can see that on an average day, on average night, there are about 30, 40, 50 American aircraft there. Singapore plays a quiet role, an effective role. And there's a long list of smaller players that achieve things that are very real um, by making real efforts, mm-hmm. which are meaningful to them Mm -hmm. in political terms, and they're appreciated by them. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are playing uh, a a role. Now, there are parts of the world, such as Northeast Asia, where the powers are lonely. Uh, There is no, you you have Japan, the two Koreas, Russia and China, and that's it. And there is nobody in between, there's nobody nearby. Of course, since 1945, there's been the remote presence of the United States uh, 
being a, a localized power, having air forces in Korea and naval forces in Japan. But you don't have the interplay that you have in Europe. And of course, with the multiplicity of countries, you don't have the interplay you have in Africa. Mm -hmm. in, in the past, when there were very serious um, security breakdowns, wars, civil wars, so on, in West Africa, uh, in spite of all the problems of all these countries and all their shortcomings, they were able to, again, time and again, to assemble a West African force, which we know was not great and they had all kinds of problems, but the fact is they were able to work together and achieve results. Mm -hmm. uh, this was, even now in the Boko Haram case, you have the Chad uh, playing a disproportionate role as a security provider for much bigger countries like Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So this is always a question of having one or two effective parts of your state and political leadership that wants to use them, and a political leadership that is somehow rewarded for using them, either by internal admiration and support and pride, or they're rewarded because outside powers mm -hmm. appreciate them and support them. Yeah. Uh, some point, adjacent to Congo, which is in a state of permanent crisis, with very weak institutions. Uh, you know, you call the Congolese army because you're attacked by guerrillas and they uh, loot and steal more than the original guerrillas. But in next in that world, where there are in, famously ineffective states, there's also Rwanda, which is famously effective. Um, in lesser known cases in West Africa, where there are all kinds of issues, there is Togo, uh, which functions uh, uh, in many respects at, at the European level. And you arrive at, the, at the, let's say, at the Nigerian airport, anything can happen. Uh, you know, custom people try to shake you down or whatever it is. You arrive in Togo and you give your passport. The person uh, looks at the passport and stamps the password and says, welcome to Togo. Mm -hmm. You might as well be in Switzerland yeah. and so on. So there are... In the people who operate internationally are aware of the fact that there are these highly effective states, mm -hmm. even when they're surrounded by much less effective ones. Yeah. I'll give you a final example. Kazakhstan is often along with other nearby states with the same background of having been former Soviet republics. Well, the one difference is that the people who run the Kazakh governments are not the nephews, the sons, the cousins, sons-in-laws. They are technocrats. And who exactly are these technocrats? Well, they are the people who are, have the, let's call them conventional uh, qualifications. So the best economist will be you know, a candidate to be the head of the central bank. And um, some of the figures in the Kazakh government, uh, I mean, the. Uh, for example, the current president was a diplomat. As a diplomat, uh, he had perfect Chinese and perfect Russian. He, of course, he had uh, perfect English, and this was okay, normal. So, and then, and then you know, so and there are countries that are operating successfully and getting real benefits from having those uh, skill sets. And I didn't mention one country to you that is special because of resources it has. Uh, and uh, in that regard, you can compare the United Arab Emirates as being, let's, you have United Arab Emirates with Abu Dhabi and so on, with all these very prolific oil fields and so on, could have been a group of people who are quietly sitting there and uh, cashing their checks or, uh, you know, spending the money wired to them as the uh, every time an oil company lifts some oil, uh, the money is wired uh, to some account, and these people could be sitting around to spend it. And instead, they've, as you know, tried to do all, all kinds of different things, including, uh, you know, building ski scopes. Mm -hmm. So we have this geography. There are almost two hundred countries. Yeah, I would say three quarters of them uh, 
have leadership that doesn't try to do anything other than basically uh, do the laundry and collect the taxes and so on. And then you have those that have effective leadership. There's a big reward to that. Yeah. I mean, you know, final case is Israel. Israel is a country that is always in trouble for one reason or another. Yeah. And whenever it is in trouble for any particular reason, uh, somebody pops up who happens to have uh, the solution for that problem. And instead of being put aside, he is elevated and whether he becomes prime minister, which he usually doesn't, somehow or other power converges to him. He's made the plenipotentiary de facto. De facto, even if sometimes the world has never heard of them until years later, mm -hmm. that plenipotentiary he then assembles a team of the talents and they solve the problem that apparently is not soluble. Sure. So, you know, it's a matter of uh, efficiency uh, guided by uh, the indispensable mechanism, which is patriotism. Yeah. Patriotism. In all of these countries, however different. Okay, mm -hmm. You go to Norwegian in private, okay, in private, and he will admit to you under pressure that Norway is the best country ever, and the Norwegians are the best people ever, and that's all there is to it. <laughs> and if you go to the Togolese and you say to the Togolese, how come flying to your airport means no shakedowns, no this, no that, just like in Switzerland, he says, nous on est Togolais. Or if they're 99 years old, they say, wir bin von Togo, because it was a German colony. The Germans only left 100 years ago, but apparently 100 is not enough to take the German out of the Togo system. Yeah. The, the Uthang Togolese soldier for not looting, but instead protecting, and he says to you, Dienst, yeah. you know, Dienst, which is a German word, which means service. In other words, I'm employed to be a soldier. So these you find this scattered around the world that play a big role in making people less unhappy. Yeah. It seems to me that from your explanation, there's three different categories of middling nations and they, how, how they provide their importance. Firstly, it seems to me the length of their experience. So if you look at a nation like Norway or Singapore, they've had a long time in international affairs to be a mediator in international, uh, in international disputes. You have another set of criteria which looks at their expertise inside government, the technocrats and those who actually know how to run a government that brings in the expertise and brings them their importance. And the third level would be their natural resources. So naturally, because they have uh, copper or oil or gas, uh, they become important naturally because of that. They may not be as big as the other nations, but because of that, they have the power in their hands uh, to fulfill whatever agenda they have. So keeping that in mind, what, how do investors, because this podcast typically, this interview will look into the investor classes. It, strikes me that a lot of conversations that I've had in the past with investors, and we've spoken about this before together, some of them have no clue or have really little understanding of how geopolitics impacts their investments. And given as more nations are growing, uh, the emerging markets and frontier markets are becoming a place for investment to come into. What are the biggest lessons do you think that investors need to know more about when it comes to analyzing emerging markets and frontier markets that they don't have a grip on right now? Well, they, um, you mentioned the raw materials. As you know, um, it's for a very long time now, everybody has known that the possession of raw materials is a double-edged sword because it means that the government doesn't have to satisfy its citizens um, to be able to extract taxes from them yeah. because it's getting the taxes are wired to them by the entities that purchase their raw material. Sure. Thereby uh, disconnecting, making the government not dependent on its population, which variously can mean that either they eat all the money or B, they simply don't provide a good government service. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in th so these are, for investors, this is a crucial calculation. Yeah. Uh, for example, um, in New Guinea, Papua New Guinea happens to have extremely uh, valuable gold deposits, which are large and easily extractable. Uh, to the, even 
at gold prices much below today's level, those mines ought to be very profitable. Mm -hmm. The problem is that the government of New Guinea is not a government that actually seeks to maximize revenues for the population of New Guinea. Mm -hmm. For they don't create they don't create an in, an investment climate mm -hmm. where they attract the most efficient gold miners. They attract the gold miners they can afford to lose mm -hmm. uh, and to cope with other confiscations, arbitrary taxation, uh, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you have um, a phenomenon like the Russian Federation. Mm -hmm. uh, the Russian Federation uh, has been losing things uh, for, you know, the, the Soviet Union had accumulated enormous amounts of locked-in wealth. Um, you know, you could take over some company you never heard of and you would drive out to its third warehouse, the one that people have forgot about. And right there, there could be $72 million worth of copper just sitting there. Yeah. And that is how the famous looting took place. Yeah. And so. And what's happened is that that the old Soviet Union was looted. And in uh, 1990, we are now in 2020. In other words, 30 years of looting. And after 30 years of looting, Russia is still full of, of uh, unreclaimed riches of all kinds and resources of all kinds. And the other peculiarity is that the Soviet educational system was very often run by culturally ambitious people. So there are pools of talents of different kinds all over the place. Mm -hmm. Hence, the before an investor of any kind should look at any country, they should first of all look at the Russian Federation. As an example of what to and look for. Yeah, I mean, when you, you want talent, go to the Russian Federation. Mm -hmm. Don't wait until the other civilian boys filter their way through and end up in Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. you, you know, still there in Novosibirsk. You can find them. So whether you want uh, human talent or you want gold and any other known raw material, you know, uh, that you, you can look on the periodic table of chemistry, mm -hmm. go to Russia. Mm -hmm. um, myself, I uh, seriously considered um, bringing my cattle raising business to uh, the plains south of Vladivostok, mm -hmm. which happened to have the world's best grassland. And in spite of the Siberian location, quite a long season because of the sea. And um, I figured that this would be the world's best place to raise Angus beef that you can sell in Beijing for $50 a kilo retail in suddenly tuned supermarkets, which advertise the fact that they don't sell anything made in the People's Republic of China. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Even water is imported, okay? So you so you do that all that, and then you discover that there is an insurmountable obstacle, which is to say that the Vladivostok, the governor of Vladivostok, the government of Vladivostok, they're absolutely not interested in anything constructive. Yeah. What they want is they they want you to give them money before you're allowed to invest in their country. Yeah. And so this is not limited to Russia. No way. But the reason why it's important for Russia is because Russia has both the raw materials and the human talents, both. Mm -hmm. And the that is why it is the biggest investment hollow star of mm -hmm. you know, black star in the world. Mm -hmm. um, the whole global productivity would get a jump yeah. if Russia had the investment climate of a semi semi okay country. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean investment climate of Denmark or whatever it is. I'm talking about the investment climate of I don't know, Portugal or yeah. Italy that is worse, you know. Uh, bad Italian, you know. So the, we have investors, however, have made money in the Russian Federation when they've been able to find some particular way of introducing their investment. Mm -hmm. You know, an investment, a shield of some sort. That has happened. 
and it can be successful. But as I say, it's the biggest investment black hole in the world. Yeah. To give it, uh, uh, you know what country uh, was the largest wheat exporter last year in the world? Do you know what is the country? I'm going to say Russia. From, well, from, 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 your, from your head. Russia. There you go. Russia, of course. Russia. Yeah, yeah. So what happened there was, well, they allowed a few guys to, to um, you know, uh, take advantage of the world's best soil. Mm -hmm. uh, the Ukrainians have some of it. The Russians have even more of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and uh, immediately Russia becomes, you know, I don't know if you're, you're too young to remember this, but from between 19, 1950 or 55 and to the end of the Soviet Union, Soviet Union periodically went to the world market to buy wheat yeah. for bread. Okay? And so uh, that these are extreme cases, but they're in fact such situations all over the world. Sure. And they, they're very important for investors sure. when investors can come in and bring their own shield. Sure. Either their own shield, or there's a shield of some institution, mm -hmm. or there's something they're operating that you can actually successfully invest in That's right. because you are somehow secured uh, through it, either internally or externally and so on. And there are very big such opportunities yeah. around the world. I've noticed because again, with your experience in the oil world, I've noticed even with our clients that a lot of the oil and gas um organizations they have a much better appreciation for for risk and geopolitical risk because they are engaged in very difficult uh places around the world where they need to debate and they need to engage with these governments and with these institutions in a much more deeper and historical way than let's say tech or fashion or or or, or the hotel business or, or sort of services yeah, but so that, they have a much better kind of appreciation of these things yeah. you know that the reason they can do that is uh, because of the internal organization um, of these entities. A Houston, the Houston oil culture, uh, the Houston oil companies, um, they will take a 25-year-old graduate of the Texas A&M, they will put him out on some oil rig drilling somewhere in the world. And in order to drill uh, use an oil well, you have to write checks every day for a million, two million, three million, four million, ten million for the different suppliers to come in and bring you the special mod, they bring in this, mm -hmm. and all the other requirements you have and so on. Mm -hmm. The Houston Oil Company is able to hire these graduates from Texas A&M to entrust them and give them the power to write these million dollar checks every two minutes or every three days, whatever it is. And when their competitors come in, let's say even a big uh, European company like Total, mm -hmm. okay, you can't write a check on an oil rig out in, in uh, Central Asia. Mm -hmm. It has to go through the proper process of authorization. So you lose a day, you lose two days, mm -hmm. you have hugely in this adventure. So every minute later, it costs you something. So that is why, you know, you have these, the first, the people who always find the oil fields where there is no known oil is always the American independents who operate out of Houston and so forth. And a company like, like Exxon, even though it's such a giant company, it's full of people who are, absurdly young for the amount of money that they are authorized to spend on their own yeah. compared to any other company. So there is, it's not a mystique. It's not an undefinable cultural trait. It's internal practices. Mm -hmm. You have internal practices where these young fellows are authorized to write checks and you have developed methods to tell the ones you can trust and the ones you can't. You develop safeguards of different kinds. Yeah. You have uh, people who go and inspect and so on. Sure. And um, uh, Compliance you have and money have laundering all, processes, these things. Yeah, they have auditors who understand. Mm -hmm. You know, auditors who 
understand that the guy who wrote this check to uh, for some trucks and the trucks never showed up. And then he immediately wrote another check for the other trucks that came up in order to understand that this was not a mistake. Mm -hmm. No, what happened was that he was optimizing yeah. the way well, he needed the truck. He was optimizing that moment or that day. Situation changed. It turned out that retroactively became a, a mistake. And you don't then say, oh, he made a mistake. The, you have the correct auditing. In other words, sure. you, ca you cannot just start off with the intention of sure. being a successful investor sure. by being very flexible and by sure. trusting people sure. internally and, sorry, selecting people that you can trust. Yes. Then you have to, man you have to maintain them by, by not then switching suddenly to conventional things like mm -hmm. yeah so these are cultural factors you know it's like silicon valley startup success mm -hmm. the crucial ingredient in silicon valley startup success is that mm -hmm. with some exceptions there are famous exceptions a lot of the people have gone bankrupt three times before they hit the fourth so in a in a in a commercial culture where being bankrupt means that you have to retire from the scene and take a job as a verger. The verger being the person who maintains the church and garden for a canon or priest. If you have gone bankrupt, you have to become a verger. <laughs> In those places, whereas the Silicon Valley attitude is, oh, the guy went yeah. bankrupt, he learned his lesson. He yeah. won't be bankrupt to end with this thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. By yeah. Man, you know, so... It, it, if investment efficiency requires a quality that the investment climate does not favor, sure. namely intelligent risk taking. Well, there's two things of that, isn't there? It's 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 the organizations that can have the resources to to do this due diligence and that can afford to actually understand how their markets operate. And also it's the culture, as you mentioned, because in Silicon Valley or even in some places, even in the UK or London, in the startup scene, there's so much capital, so much cheap capital available, the startups happen every day. So you have that sense of learning and and uh, and changing because innovation is always changing. In the world like oil and gas, the, biz the, the, the business process is, has been unchanged since the beginning. So when you mm. do fail, you fail not because you haven't understood uh, the game or the the concept of the business model is because fundamentally you haven't done the due diligence that you needed to do to become successful. So there are two different ways of, of, of operating. But you're right in saying that I think it's interesting to see how different kinds of uh, industries are responding to the rise, not only, only geopolitical risk, but also globalization to different transformative technologies and societal changes. For example, if you take something like the fashion industry, the last thing the fashion industry in the past had to worry about was geopolitics. But for example, when 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 big fashion brands put out uh, you know uh, apparel which they tried to sell in China, and for example, one uh, company where they have the outline of of, of, of China, they don't include uh, Hong Kong. That means the Chinese uh, you know uh, consumers they boycott this brand. Their uh, their sponsors and their uh, their their representatives you know cut relations. Their stock prices drop and they lose their reputation. So it's easy to see how industries like that and others, when they engage in different parts of the world, they need that cultural understanding and that geopolitical awareness to be successful. Yeah, well, you know, it's, um, uh, it's a matter of, uh, you know, cultural adaptation. And, um, the, of course, the, many people in the investment universe um, have they don't have the goal of maximization. Uh, they don't want to maximize capital growth. What they want to maximize is, for example, uh, reliability, calm, not to worry about it. Mm -hmm. um, most investment money goes for things that advertise their lack of uh, profitability. And, and what they advertise is the reliability. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. there's a huge, such a huge demand for German state bonds that they pay a negative interest rate. Um, why would anybody take money and put it in a negative interest rate? That, of course, is a different set of 
of questions. Mm-hmm. And why does the European Central Bank consider itself as doing a, a good job, even though you have negative interest rates? I mean, negative in, interest rates, uh, if you are flying in an aircraft, which is in the process of going backwards, you ought to ask yourself questions whether you are such a good pilot, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, if you, because if you go to Frankfurt, Germany, you might go through the entire city and run across, you know, dancers and taxi drivers, professors, fishermen, whatever they are. Mm-hmm. The only people who are sure, 100% sure, that they're doing a perfect job are the employees of the European Central Bank. You know, the managers, the people who run it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. they think that they are the world's, world's the best central bankers in human history since the Stone Age. <laughs> and then when you ask them questions, like, what does it mean, negative interest rates? What does that mean, negative interest rates? What does it mean if you take Lufthansa Airlines and you you take off and after six hours with some turbulence, you land at the airport where you took off? Uh, and accept that before you can deboard the plane, you have to buy a ticket. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, if Lufthansa was operating like European Central Bank, I'm going to get far. Yeah. So, yeah. So, when such institutions are able to function this way, and everybody nods and nods and so forth, it means that there is a systemic issue, mm-hmm. something that is systemic and underlying the entire thing, mm-hmm. and. Again, when you go to Chancellor Merkel and you say, look, uh, you're the queen of Germany, um, and uh, in your kingdom, there are some peculiarities. For example, I happen to be a retired flower seller, and I'm not a gambler. Do I look like a gambler? No. And, you know, Frau Merkel, I am not a gambler, and uh, I'm not an adventurer, and I have saved these money here. You see this? Yeah. I have a thousand I've euros. Out, I've worked out and I've saved this and money. If I go to my local bank, apart from slapping me around, so if I'm a bank robber, they'll be polite because I have a gun. But since I am a depositor, they slap me around the face and then they charge me money to deposit money. And Chancellor, you ask Chancellor Merkel, Chancellor Merkel says it's not my department. Yeah. Right, again, so you boarded this Lufthansa airplane, uh, you took off, a lot of fuel was used, you land in Lufthansa and they won't release you from the flight unless you buy a ticket. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And to Lufthansa management and they'll say to you, of course, well, why did you take this flight? And this European Central Bank, people have taken this flight every day. So investors, when they say this, must realize, yeah. That these stories never end well. No. They never, ever end well. There is somebody already used it very correctly as a title of a book, which is This Time is Different. Yeah. This time is different. You know, you go up to them and you say you see the central bank. Yeah. You don't matter. You have to create an inflationary situation. An inflationary situation yeah. where prices start rising mm-hmm. and where people rush to the bank to invest the positive money because otherwise it will lose value for inflation. You have to do all that kind of stuff. If you're an individual investor, you will not be protected by the fact that everybody else will sink. Mm-hmm. Don't board that flight. Yeah. Okay. You, you'll go much further by taking a bicycle. Yeah. So, it, reminds you know, me of, it reminds you of the... Uh, for example... I will disclose to your audience here my current business project. Okay. I bought some land uh, an hour from my house mm-hmm. in the suburban area of Washington. And it's quite a big piece of land. I'm fencing it. And I'm going to raise feral goats there. Those are the goats which are trained to, to live by themselves without the shepherd. Mm-hmm. Because non-feral goats... They have you have to pay for expensive dogs to protect them from the uh, suburban doggery 
and coyotes and sunspur. Mm -hmm. Taking a piece of land, I'm fencing it, putting feral goats there, so periodically I'll be able to go and grab one and put it in my oven. Because baked goat, as any Parisian cook knows, you know, the chevre, the chevre, you know, the young chevre is the best meat there is. And why am I doing that? I'm doing that because I, I am not persuaded by the U.S. Treasury declaration that you can run a gigantic deficit uh, and it has no consequences, and you can print dollars without consequences. I'm not persuaded. I cannot take my money and put it in euros. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I could uh, airdrop it on Switzerland since the Swiss don't accept deposits. And so I decided to buy a piece of land, yeah. which is, say, the most primitive form of investment there is, I think so. based on primitive overall statements, namely that they don't make it anymore. Sure. And the reason I put goats in it is because actually this is the only way of generating some income from it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so investors have to think in those terms. Mm -hmm. Of course, they don't have to buy land, they don't have to put goats, but sure. there is these areas, including in seemingly very crowded places like telecom investing, which are in fact still as free and open as this piece of land I found. Mm -hmm. And to give a specific example, as you know, every passing day, the notorious instability of quantum computers. Yeah, we spoke about becomes, this last time, I remember. What? I said we spoke about this last Sorry. time. It's, it's an interesting topic. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, their, their notorious instability and impracticability gets a little better every day or so. And at that point, there is a, there is a ample opportunity to, to utilize quantum computers mm -hmm. in order to take on all those tasks which were impossible before mm -hmm. because of computational limitations. Mm -hmm. Since computers are so powerful, ordinary laptop I'm using is so powerful, Mm -hmm. There are not many areas where computational limitations are, in, in fact, area, yeah. but there are such areas. And the whole realm of fluid dynamics is one of them, which has numerous applications from the design of boat hulls and so on. For example, if you are a boat builder and there are, there's boat building going on around the world for different purposes, Mm -hmm. You can avail yourself of the services of a quantum computer for approximately, I would say, 10 seconds. 10 seconds. You can optimize your hull designs and you're able to advertise uh, for the tanker trade, the container trade, or anybody the mm -hmm. fact that your hull over a predicted lifetime of uh, 21 years would save this amount of energy mm -hmm. in going through water, you know, sea states that the composite sea state and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are definitely opportunities there where you have, of course, an existing market and a new technology or an old technology and a new market. Sure. The pandemic has been, of course, um, has destroyed some markets and created new ones. We know that there are lots of new businesses arising. Mm -hmm. 100%, um, 100%, you can see that. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know. But what, what, what do you yeah. think in terms of, Edward, what do you think in terms of, right now, from what we see as well, that because the world is so complex and because um, there's sort of a fog of war or a fog of information that... Uh, no, not, not everything is transparent in the world of business and you go to specific parts of the world where you may not have all the intelligence and especially in more developed markets like in Europe and America and some parts of Southeast Asia, you have developed markets, but then you have this phenomenon of information overload and you have sort of the phenomenon of fake news becoming much more apparent in the business circle, not only in the sort of the, the socio-political circle, but also in the business and investment uh, world as well. 
you have that reflexive relationship that George Soros talks about uh, in terms of markets and different investment products like ESG, etc. How can decision makers make confident and long-term decisions given all of this comp- uh, uh, confusion and complexity in more established markets and in more uh, up-and-coming markets? Is there a structure, is there a methodology that you think they should implement in order to make more confident and more profitable investing decisions in the long term? Well, um, you know, the, the investor uh, benefits from having um, better data, of course, and he looks for better data through uh, techniques that imply that you, the data has to be found. You have to generate the data. Mm-hmm. Let's say you want to sell mobile tower cranes, you know, then you have to begin by asking yourself how much construction is taking place and how much of that construction is under five floors high because mobile tower cranes are not much good above that. Um, and then you go and you start looking for data, of course. And so it is a peculiarity of our current situation that the, there is a hell of a lot, there's an ocean of data waiting for you, which is simply misclassified from your point of view. Mm -hmm. It was classified for somebody else, but not for you. Mm -hmm. And having a data person working for you, and you tell this person, you know what? I don't want you to look for new data. We're all doing that every day. Mm -hmm. I want you to look for data that is misclassified. Mm -hmm. And is to say, from your point of view, misclassified. Mm -hmm. Somebody classified is convenient, but not for you. Yeah, and that would be an example where you are you are in one trade, and you look for data that has been assembled for a completely different trade, a t- totally different industry, but which they nevertheless have. Mm-hmm. So, um, for example, there um, you have um, the Air, airline, every U.S., every manufacturer of aircraft now has a system where they download flight operation data automatically from every flight that goes into their evolving database sure. for the purposes of optimizing what they, uh, for example, maintenance information mm-hmm. to be optimized by not only, let's say, measuring flight hours, which they always did, but to measure flight hours under different stress levels. That is, flight hours with their hard landing, soft landing, and this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody, this data is for them to improve themselves as a manufacturer, right? Yeah. But somebody could go to them, such as an airline, and use this data to optimize their own fuel purchasing mm-hmm. and their own locations and their own fueling instructions to pilots. Now, I happen to have some connection with this industry, and I want to tell you that this is not happening. Every airline wants to optimize fuel use, right? By, uh, you know, as you know, some airlines invest, uh, they advertise uh, punctuality, Punctuality, And therefore, in some airlines, they tell the pilots that if you're falling behind for whatever reason, and you can catch up by flying faster, then we authorize you to fly faster. And all these are all areas that are transferable from industry to industry, trade to trade, where there is somebody who has a lot of data, which they need for themselves, in which they will never give to their competitor, right? Boeing is not going to give it to Airbus, right? But Boeing, because in a different format, which would be of no use to Airbus. I mean, Airbus, for example, would want data used for the functioning of a certain aircraft type 
regardless of who operates it. But you can go and get this data. There is lots of data which is available if you look for it, which is to misclassified from your point of view. Mm-hmm. A lot of this data you can collect yourself at a vastly greater cost than the cost of finding it in somebody else's possession. Mm-hmm. Now, moreover, about 20 years ago, uh, some people started saying data is the new oil. Mm-hmm. Data is a you know very important raw material. Sure. But if you may notice, there was a failure to develop a market for data. Mm-hmm. The reason that data should be the new oil, I agree with that. You need to refine it. You need the refineries to make it valuable. Well, you you need uh, where is the gas station where I can go mm-hmm. and put data? Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, for example, my goat farm. Um, you know, my goat farm will be more successful if I can provide goats for the Muslim Eid al-Hadam trade, you know, the day of the sacrifice yeah. trade. Yeah. They have to take and cut off the neck sure, sure, of sure. some sheep or goat. I refuse to have sheep. You know, sheep are in, every investor should stay away from sheep. Sheep put their hands in a hole and they're too stupid to walk out of it. <laughs> uh, so I want to have data, for example, sure. about observant Muslims who live within easy driving range so they can come and buy the goat and shove it in the back of the boot and so on. And I can provide them, you know, with the deodorant and kits and um, something to wash the boot when they take it home so they can do the, the proper thing. Mm-hmm. All of this data, I would like to be able to drive up to a gas station where I can get this data. If data is oil, yeah. there ought to be... A System and there isn't, and this is a gigantic opportunity right there. But can't you Not see? For, can't, sorry, can't you see you know, any companies which are doing that? Optimization. Sorry. Are you on? Can you not see any companies now that are doing? Who is the best company or the best software that you think is doing the best to fulfill that need, or is that need still unfulfilled? I don't see the need fulfilled at all because I'm not talking here. I'm talking about a gas station. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about uh, somebody who goes around and buys odd lots left over from odd refineries and, you know, uh, makes it available for, for the market. Mm-hmm. If if data is the new oil, we need gas stations, mm-hmm. and we don't have them. That could be the title uh, of your new book. Well, it's somebody <laughs> else's book. <laughs> but so this is... A, you know, phenomena. So, as you know, at any moment in time, sure. we are surrounded and we are ourselves phenomena, right? Mm-hmm. And then there is all the meta phenomena that comes with it. Mm-hmm. And in the realm of meta phenomena is this fact of data that is misclassified from your point of view. Mm-hmm. Because, and you know, and this is an opportunity. Um, I mean, in my case, uh, I, what I could do, um, in, you know, if I could turn to a gas station, the gas station might answer to me, uh, are you uh, pay me a fee of uh, $72.50, and I'll tell you how to solve this problem with three phone calls. Mm-hmm. Provide me with three numbers. Mm-hmm. And that would be, the numbers of the three mosques within uh, 30 miles of my ranch. Sure. I would call three of them and ask them uh, how many people there uh, slaughter for yeah. the yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, you, of you, Adam. You get the macro yeah. ones from that. that. That's what we are missing, the meta structure in the realm of data. Okay. That meta structure is a big opportunity for lots of people Mm -hmm. uh, because they work at any scale. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So there are these things. As I'm sitting here, and I mentioned two, which is to say the the occasional use of quantum computing by people who only need quantum computing now and then, Mm -hmm. and the matter of contacting one of these experimenters, 
you know, Honeywell is one of them. Honeywell is an engineering company. Sure. Uh, they're kind of serious people. They answer the phone. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, into this area. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, a few years ago, there was a big stuff going on about blockchain. Yeah. And there was a bit of a blockchain boom. It caught me personally in some embarrassment because I happen to be an interest in blockchain from its beginning, from its origins, mm -hmm. uh, because of the technology connection. Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, then I saw a big boom in blockchain. Everybody was going to blockchain. You know, housewife uh, is not good at cooking, but she's now going to blockchain her, her kitchen and, and so on and so forth. You know, flower collectors, um, mm -hmm. long distance mm -hmm. bridge, yeah, blockchain. Yeah, yeah. Well, and then, and then, you know, so. Um, and would you say, would, when, would you see these things as trends for 2021? If you were to look at the sort of trends that you see as important for the business world and for the political world in this new year. We have, and I promise not to go to superpowers, but the question still remains of the 2020 uh, election in the United States of America. What will happen with Trump's legal appeals? Will Biden finally become uh, the, the new president? Give me some things that, no, that, they, that, they, that, that you think investors would need to care about. Five different the things. US election, the U.S. election will occur on December 14. I think yeah. it's December 14, December 11. Yeah. And it happens before December. Uh, is only the fact that there's polling in different places mm -hmm. and there are newspaper, uh, sorry, media estimates. Yeah. The numbers that are claimed to the world are the estimates of the Associated Press. Mm -hmm. It's the Associated Press that believes that John won the election or Mary won the election. Actually, the election only takes place when the electors designated for each state uh, cast their votes. Mm -hmm. Then there is a two-week period for the horsemen, because it was done in the time of the horses, can get to Washington where the votes will be officially counted, yeah. where the countdown starts for the inauguration on January 21st. Mm -hmm. But we've had no election in the United States. If you would, for president or vice president, sure. we have had Lots of elections for state assemblies all over yeah. the United States. That's right. For governors, some of them, not others. And we've had elections for the House and the Senate. This data is actual official data. Mm -hmm. But we don't have presidential, vice presidential. However, it appears, guess is, that Biden has won. Mm -hmm. And everybody is acting like it. And Donald Trump is going to act like it well before election date. Mm -hmm. In other words, before that the electors cast their votes in December, he will have stopped these appeals and complaints. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't see any uncertainty at all. Mm -hmm. There is an administration, it's emerging day by day, they're announcing people. And as you know, for the investors of the world, um, it's a good lesson in the future uh, when they're following an American presidential election is to read only the sports pages <laughs> until uh, about a month before the end because what you heard all through the time were the names of, um, of uh, Sanders, a self-described socialist, yeah. then there were the, the Elizabeth Warren, and then there were a parade of people. There was this Booty, booty, booty guy, you know, the 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 pretty little boy who was yeah. running president. Buttigieg, then yeah. the old boy was also pretty. And there are people coming and going. And then who do they pick? The most socially, culturally conservative person who belongs to the Democratic Party, mm -hmm. a certain Mr. Biden. Mm -hmm. That's who they pick. And who do they pick for vice president? We had a parade of colorful figures. They parade Kamala Harris, mm -hmm. who is a very conservative, yeah. culturally conservative person, et cetera, who was very unpopular with the blacks because of she was such a tough yeah. prosecutor in California. Right. California so yeah. they pick the most conservative yeah. people. In the House, um, the Democrats were supposed to win 200 seats. 
and turn America Green New Deal and socialist and so on. Actually, they lose six seats, no, seven seats they lose, and the the um, Republicans gain eight seats because there was some independent they picked up. Sure. So, Senate, we don't know yet, but there's certainly 50 senators on the Republican side. There aren't 50 on the Democratic side. So they would have to be really unlucky not to have the Senate. Mm -hmm. We had the most agitated election, the most left-wing election, the most progressive thing. They're going to be taxing this and doing that. And at the end of it, the most conservative possible outcome. Yeah. More conservative than it seems. Yeah. Because Nobody reports about the state elections. Sure. But state elections, it's a big Republican victory. You can see which that. Means that. They will have the power to design the the uh, the actual uh, constituency boundaries, yeah. which means a guaranteed Republican victory next time around. Mm -hmm. So all this um, left-wing agitation, and then you get such a conservative result. Sure. Do you see yourself doing any work with the Biden administration in, in, in a few words? Well, it's, it's different. You see, I have never been, um, I have known presidents, and I know Mr. Biden. Uh, if you go on the internet and you put my name in his, you'll get some strikes where we work together and different things. I've known him for a time, actually. Uh, but I never work for presidents. Mm -hmm. I only work for institutions. Mm -hmm. I work for uh, I work as an advisor for every president. Um, it doesn't matter because I am a strategic advisor to the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. I'm not a personal friend of presidents mm -hmm. whispering sweet things in his ears. I work for the government under a contract. Yeah, they, they give you a contract, you know, yeah. and uh, and they buy strategic advice, and um, I try to give them my strategic advice. I but that. I don't work. For I work for institutions. Yeah, and you have many years of experience which you've shared with us today. I'd like to thank you very much, Dr. Dutuk, for your time today. And um, I'm sure everyone listening will really enjoy your insights. So thank you once again. And um, this is going to be up very, very soon.